All right. Who knew what a bassoon was when they were in sixth grade? I didn't know what it was. I don't even know. I don't remember seeing one. <laughs> um, and our guest for today's interview, Rachel Jussack, uh, actually didn't know what it was either when she first started. She um, started on the flute uh, and then wanted to switch over to the mysterious instrument, the bassoon. Um, so I hope you all will enjoy this interview with Rachel. Um, she is a bassoonist in the Boston Lyric Opera and in the Cape Symphony in Massachusetts. And um, I have known her since 2000, I should have figured this out, 2012, 13, 14. We used to play in a woodwind quintet together and we traveled the country doing chamber music competitions and Rachel was always just such a stellar bassoon player and friend um, that I'm so happy to share her knowledge with all the BDSG community. Um, so if you don't know who I am, I'm Katie Velasquez. I'm one of the co-founders of BDSG, Band Director Survival Guide, and I'm also Principal Flute of the Missouri Symphony. And so we bring content to you from um, exceptional players, performers, and teachers so that this knowledge and this um, all of this is accessible to everyone. It uh, doesn't matter if you're in a conservatory or if you teach at an elementary school, you can have the same knowledge that um, some of the best performers um, have been taught. So um, if you like this content, if you liked our interview series, um, please give us a like uh, on our page, Band Director Survival Guide. Or we also have a Facebook group and an Instagram and a YouTube all by the same name and all of our interviews are on our website and on our YouTube account um, band directors survival guide so check those out and you can head to our website to read more about Rachel and um, you can also work with her in one of our advancement programs this fall um, if you think what she says is totally awesome which I know you will <laughs> um, and so head to our website band directors survival uh, to find out more about that and so I hope you all enjoy this interview with my friend Rachel. I'm so excited to share it with you. All right, hi everyone. I'm here with Rachel Jussack and she is the bassoonist of the Boston Lyric Opera and I'm so happy to have her today. We've known each other for a long time. We used to play in quintet together in like 2012, 2013, it was a long time ago, but thank you so much for being here, Rachel. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, um, okay, so can you just tell the audience a little bit about you, the bassoon, just who you are and all that stuff? Sure, um, so as Katie said, my name is Rachel Jessack. Um I started the bassoon a little late as far as, I guess, other music, careers would go. I always loved music, so I was always testing out instruments, but I didn't start the bassoon until basically the summer before high school. Um, I had started on the viola in, I think it was third grade when they introduced the instrument. And for a variety of reasons, I decided to quit, but I still wanted to do music. So when they introduced the band instruments, I was like, oh, okay, flute. And then um, I didn't take private lessons though. So I got bored pretty quickly as I noticed my friends who did take private lessons were getting really good and I got discouraged. And because of that, I decided I wanted to switch to a different instrument. <laughs> um, and at this point, my parents were getting a little frustrated with all the switching. And so they said, Rachel, if you're gonna switch, you have to, you're gonna go into high school and now we have to think about college. So you have to switch to an instrument that you could get a scholarship on for college. And so I said, okay, fine. Um, but before they had even told me this, I showed up in, uh, was it middle school band one day? And my friend was, instead of playing her flute, which she, we had both played flute, she was playing this really weird looking instrument that I'd never seen before. It was this giant stick and it, <laughs> it sounded really weird, but also cool. I thought it was the coolest instrument ever. And um, I wanted to play that one. And it just so happened that it was the bassoon and orchestras and wind ensembles have a high need for bassoon players. So it, it worked out perfectly. And she was actually my first teacher, my friend. Uh, she taught me the basic notes, gave me a read from the, the woman she was studying with at the time. And so over the summer, she taught me the basics. And then when high school started, I 
began um, taking private lessons from her instructor as well, who was, I guess, my first real instructor. But I always give my my best friend, Laura, credit for being my first teacher. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Wow. So what do you what were you doing like um, right before the pandemic hit, like as a musician? What were you up to? Actually, um, so with Boston Lyric Opera, we were in the midst of uh, getting a, a production ready. We had our final dress rehearsal uh, for our upcoming production, which being in the house all day has made me forget what the production was called. Um, <laughs> it'll come to me at some point throughout this interview. Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it was... Um, Anyway, so we had played our dress rehearsal, our final dress rehearsal, and then the next day it was announced that <clears throat> um, we weren't, like, the shows were being canceled. And luckily the production company, or Boston Lyric at the time, uh, kind of suspected that this was a strong possibility. So they did an audio recording of our final dress rehearsal, which then uh, the local radio station, as well as on the Boston Lyric website, they uh, live streamed it during, while everyone was stuck at home. So people could actually hear it, even if they couldn't see it, which was, and it was nice for us as uh, musicians too, because we could hear how it went as well, which you don't always get to do as a musician because you're just playing. Totally. Yeah, that's what I was doing. And uh, that was the big thing I was doing, at least. When cool. We yeah, and now everything has changed. Everything's online. So, um, okay, we're gonna jump into some questions here and let's see. I have a question about like kind of what are you doing um, for teaching online? Like, are you teaching online? And if so, like, what are you doing to make it awesome for kids? <laughs> okay, yes, I am teaching online. Um, luckily, since due to my um, traveling freelance lifestyle, in addition to playing with Boston Lyric, I have had instances before the pandemic where I've had to have video lessons. Um, or if I had to travel for an audition, you know, I would, I've had occasional video lessons prior to this, so it wasn't, it didn't take me completely by surprise, which was good. Um, but yeah, so I'm teaching all of my students um, online through video lesson right now. Uh, I have done a couple socially distanced in-person lessons, though, while the weather is still nice before the New England cold weather hits. Um, so that's been actually very nice. But yeah, teaching online, what was your other question, the other part of the question? Are you, okay, what are you doing? Are you doing anything special to make it special for your students or is it just the same old same old yeah so um when it went online a lot of things had to be canceled like i had a lot of students who were in districts or um and and districts were canceled so uh, but it was also right towards the start of summer as well which um gave me a bit of freedom to kind of switch things up from the traditional i mean we still did cover scales and we worked out of etude books but um Obviously we couldn't do duets, play duets um, together because of the video delay. So I would record the teacher line um, and then I would send it to them and then they could have something to play with other than just by themselves. Um, Cause I think playing with somebody, even if it's just a recording is a, a really important. I didn't want them to lose the ability to play. Uh, to, when you play with someone else, there's a lot of things you do. You listen for intonation, all that stuff, uh, blending and so. That was the closest I could get to that. I also had everybody, um, we're actually gonna do this for the fall because we didn't get to do it for the summer, but I had all my students uh, suggest a piece that they would want to perform, like a fun piece, something fun. And everybody submitted their ideas and voted on what they wanted to do. And we picked two pieces and I'm gonna arrange it. And um, all of my students, even though they don't all know each other, they're gonna play their own part, record it, and then I'm gonna put it together. And that's. That's something we're good, fun we're gonna do. Uh, wow! Yeah, That's awesome. What are you? Um, what software are you gonna use to put it all together? Is this like acapella, iMovie? Like, what are you using? Um, so I'm probably since everybody has different different recording setups. Um, not everybody has an iPhone. Um, some people have Android, so acapella wasn't the best choice. Um, I'm just gonna have them record it, um, and then. Put it together either through iMovie or GarageBand, one, whichever one works. Sometimes, sometimes one works better than the other. <laughs> totally. Honestly, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think right now we're all trying to figure out how we can, like, look at this experience hopefully in a sort of positive way. Um, and if we need to change things up to, you know, 
kind of go in that direction, that's fine. And one of our other interviewees, Scott, is like a, are the tuba tuba player. <laughs> um, he is like living in the online world totally. He's like a YouTube sensation, you know, like for a tuba player. <laughs> he has 13,000 followers. Like, how is that possible? No. <laughs> um, and so like, or 13,000 subscribers. And anyway, so he is like really taking his time to ask himself like, wow, now all these, there's all these new skills that people can learn, such Mm -hmm. as, you know, like putting things together in iMovie or recording their part and listening to it, (laughs) that it's like, even though this is an awful time, like there are some things that we can learn and new skills that hopefully will be useful later on. Because, I mean, I think this whole switch to online learning was like bound to happen, right? We're going to a more online world in general. And it just so happened to have like taken place overnight. (laughs) And none of us, like we weren't all ready for it, but now we're all kind of like sped up in this process to to work online. So I think there are some positives for our students and they're learning new skills that I think will totally be good for them later, right? So cool. Awesome, okay. So I have another question here. Um, a lot of the students at BDSG are working towards um, all state auditions. I think it's like similar to your district auditions. Mm-hmm. Um, like, and this is something usually the students work on from like August to possibly January. So like three songs, six months, like who can play it best sort of thing, which yeah. is crazy. Um, but I guess, how does your um, experience as an auditioner yourself, because you had to win that job in the Boston Lyric Opera, um, how does that kind of transfer into what you teach students who are auditioning at any sort of level, whether it's like middle school districts or if it's like high level high school stuff for college, like how does that, how does your experience tie into all that? Well, um, it ties in very well because an audition is an audition, regardless of whether it's a district audition, all state audition, no matter how little or how big the audition, you have to prepare the same for every audition. Um, I was a horrible auditioner when I first started this process. Um, it's taken me so long to figure out what I need to do to audition. and But it's been great because now I feel very confident when I help my students. And if I do take other auditions, I have a clear plan for what I want to do. Um, But yeah, and I also used to have very, very strong uh, performance anxiety. And so, but I knew I was like, if if I wanted to do this career, I would have to get over it. So I just kept putting myself in uncomfortable situations until they weren't uncomfortable. And then I'd always, if they were still uncomfortable, I'd figure out how to make them less uncomfortable. So um, through trial and error, I think I've developed a good system, but what it is, is you just you try to prepare for all aspects of the audition, not just learning the notes and the fingerings and the rhythms, all that stuff, but the mentality towards it as well, because you can, as I've learned, you can prepare and practice all the notes and rhythms, and then the mentality can, you know, come and you can have a bad day. And because you didn't mentally prepare for like, what happens if, you don't like the chair you're sitting in and it's squeaking or the lighting is messing you up and like all these things can play into what you're doing. So I kind of, I take a well-rounded approach to auditions when it comes to focusing on all the aspects. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that's one of the most important things. And I didn't learn about that in high school at all. Like I thought it was just like, if I could play it, like I'd be fine, which like as the stakes get higher and higher, you realize that, you know, you feel more pressure here. So then this gets in the way. So yeah, that's awesome. I'm I'm happy for you that you worked on that. Yeah, totally. Because I'm still working on it too. <laughs> um, does your process like for auditioning um, adjust a little if it's like a recorded audition? Because this year for Allstate, um, all the auditions are recorded. And I know that when I'm doing a recorded audition or some sort of a recording um, that's competitive, like as soon as you hit the button, you're like, oh my gosh, (laughs) like I'm really nervous, even though I literally just like tapped a screen. That's all I did. I didn't go anywhere that I am in my normal spot of playing. I'm comfortable, but now I'm nervous. (laughs) So do you have like any help with the process for kids to kind of feel more put together when they're just like getting ready for a recorded audition? Yeah, I mean, 
um, I, the same thing would happen to me too. I would have my, my brain would go to a different place when I recorded versus, uh, had a live audition. Um, but the nice thing about recording is that well, I actually, when I prepare for auditions, I record myself because then you're so used to recording yourself when you do run throughs that it's not an issue when you just suddenly sit down and record yourself. And I think that's why people freak out when they have to record themselves for auditions. Um, because they haven't been practicing recording themselves. So that's something you have to do as well. Um, and you have like, you know, you have to practice even recording yourself different times of days. So you know, like your ambient noise is going to sound like so that doesn't distract you. But once you get used to the, you know, the mentality of not worrying once you press the recording button, then you can treat it like just a regular audition. Totally. Yeah. And one of the things I'm trying to work on with my students is having them record themselves now, early on in the process, and often, instead of, I mean, like, when I was in high school, I was like, no, 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 I can't, I can't bear to be recorded until I'm perfect. <laughs> it's like, I can't even, no, 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 like, at the very end, I'll record myself, and then I'll listen, but that's not what we're supposed to do, and, no. uh, yeah, so that's awesome that you are doing that, and that you're encouraging your students to do that, and also, like, this whole online um, world is forcing them to do that. If they're posting, like sending a, a video in for you to put together, they like mm -hmm. have to record themselves and have to listen back, which is like an unexpected benefit of all this like online learning. Yeah. And the other thing that's um, great about recording yourself um, early on, even if you think you sound terrible, which of course we're always our harshest critics. So you know, that's okay if you feel that way, as long as you work on improving what you want to improve. Uh, but the nice thing is that you'll hear maybe, oh, I didn't like where I put the microphone, or maybe I don't like my microphone at all, and I want to mm -hmm. use a different microphone, or I don't like the space I'm recording in, so I need to figure out a different location to record, or the lighting, anything, all those little, little things that, like, if you just wait to the day that you're going to record, you know, you can't fix all those the day you're going to record. So you, that's why another benefit to just starting while you practice. Um, and then the other thing that I was going to say, which I just forgot what I was going to say. That's okay. This happened to me too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to talk while you think, but this happened to me too, <laughs> because, and it's funny um, because we all like give this advice, like don't wait till the last minute. And I've been given that advice so many times, but how many times, even like in the past year or two, <laughs> I was like recording like a week before it was due. Like I had three chances to get these three pieces and then it's like, oh wow, I really should have put the microphone in a different place. I don't have any more chances. Like I just have to deal with it. And then like, okay, self, right? So like, I know that we're saying this advice and it might seem like common sense to start early, like use your good microphone, like your, whatever microphone you're planning to use for the audition start using it early try to figure out how it works and also if you're using like a um what's it called like a zoom it's interface it's called an interface where like a microphone plugs into the zoom and then it goes into your computer um start using that right now because so many times i have like not pushed the record button twice or whatever like some little thing or the gain was down or some like small specific thing and then oh my recording was awful it didn't even record like wow and I can't send it in now. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's great advice. Like start recording with your stuff and in the space you're thinking about recording in, start doing it now if you can. So I did remember what I was gonna say. Yes. <laughs> so in addition to not waiting till the day before you record or the day of that you record, I also, when I have, when I know I'm gonna record an audition, I schedule three days that I'm gonna record because I found that that's my average for getting a good recording. Whether it's the first day that I end up using or the third day or the second day, doesn't matter. Three days is usually, and everybody could be different, but for me it's three. And it's, um, cause even no matter how hard you prepare, sometimes you can't get it on the first day. So put three days aside minimum, just to be like, okay, I'm gonna record these days. That way, if there's a snowstorm, this happened to me. And <laughs> people are, uh, like clearing the roads or the sidewalks with snowblowers, you know, <sighs> that day, maybe you can't record. And then thank goodness you have two extra days or something yeah. like, that. or, you know, maybe 
the weather's weird and your read feels weird on one day. And so like the other day ended up being better, like even random stuff or just maybe the process of going through it three days, like three separate days, just you end up with a better, better take. Um, if you try to do it all in one day and then you keep doing it and keep doing it. I also did like two hour chunks. So I'll do two, like a two hours, one day, two hours, another day, two hours, a third day. Um, but if you try to do it more than that in one day, your brain usually gets burnt out. Mm -hmm. so that's, totally. That's suggestion. Yeah. Awesome. And then, okay, I just thought of a question that I wanted to ask you and <laughs> of for reads, because we all know I don't know anything about reads. <laughs> I play the flute. Um, do you have a process that makes you feel more comfortable with like your read selection when you go to an audition or you have an audition like because I know some people, I've heard people talk about, this is my best read, like I'm gonna save it for later. Or like, I don't like this one, but I'm gonna keep it and like wait, because maybe it'll work in whatever state I'm going to for this audition. Or do you have a process of like how you select your the, the read that you're gonna use at this audition? Yeah, and feel free to interrupt me if I go on too long about this topic, oh. because I really could talk about reads to the point that and, and on a level where people just aren't interested the same way I am. So um, I'm sorry if that happens, but yeah. <laughs> Fine. So I do have a process. If I know I'm going to an area, which this wouldn't apply to recorded auditions, but if I know I'm going to an area where my reads are gonna react differently, I try to start cultivating early on reads that would work in that area. Um, I also sometimes, and I don't know if this is helpful for younger students or not, um, but for me, Sometimes I practice on my worst read to feel better about myself. Um, and this is how I do it. If I can play well, the audition material well on my worst read, when I go to play my best read, I'm gonna feel a lot better about myself and things are gonna feel easier. So I'm not advocating that you always practice on your worst reads because you also need your read to do its job so you can improve yourself and hear what you need to work on personally. But like maybe once, or twice, you could try a run through, not practice session, but like a run through and see, so you know what it feels like to do it when you're not feeling great whatsoever. And then the day of you're like, hey, I feel amazing because I'm playing on my great best read, something like that. But okay. usually, um, and these are like, these are just all different things I have in my toolbox that I've tried and tested out to see what works. Um, sometimes I don't do them all, sometimes I just, if I'm hitting a roadblock, I'll try one. That's all. Um, and I usually have at least three or four reads that I know will do what I want them to do on the material I'm auditioning on. For students, I'd say maybe three, have three good reads um, and rotate through them so you don't kill one and then you're suddenly not used to playing on your other reads because that happens too. Students play so much, practice so hard, and then the day of the audition, their read is just so burnt out and basically dead. It can't vibrate well. Um, and then they have a bad audition, but they work really hard. And, you know, you don't want your student, you don't want any student to have to experience that. Uh, so it's important to rotate your reads and have at least three good ones. Perfect. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you so much. I'm sure bassoon people will love to listen to that. <laughs> that's perfect. Like, I have my one head joint and like, I hope my lips, my lips are like my read. So I'm like, oh, these are working today. Like, <laughs> you know, oh man. But cool. All right. Awesome. Let me go to another question here. Um, so, okay. What do you think students need um, in learning right now? As in like, what is best to give them right now in this like online pandemic virtual learning world? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I know we talked about this earlier, is, which kind of goes into when I teach online versus when I teach in person, I'm not trying to water anything down. Like, I'm trying to teach them the same material, but just trying to deliver it obviously virtually instead of in person. Of course, there are limitations, which, um, through trial and error since March, I've been learning, you know, how to, if I can't adjust the student's read because I'm not there, like how can I communicate what the student could do or what might be the problem that's not even read related, you know, like how can I communicate better? So actually communication, communication, trust, and let's see, there was one more, I feel like patience are the three big things when it comes to virtual teaching from the student and the teacher. Um, 
I'd say that's the big thing. Other than that, as far as content, I'm, I'm teaching the same content. You know, I still want them to have a good, strong foundation with their scales, with their etudes. I want them to be able to play musically and think musically, think analytically. But as far as, as far as teaching online, you have to have trust, patience, and good communication. Um, you really do. Yeah, and totally. It's, it's like adjusted a little bit since being in person. But oh, so going off that, do you think there's anything specific that teachers need to be like teaching right now? Like, do they use those same three concepts of patience, good communication, and trust? Trust. Okay. So it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Do they use those same three concepts, or are there any are there any additional ones that like the teacher needs to know about? Would you say? I mean, teaching virtually. You mean anything the yeah. teacher? Yeah. Hmm. I. It's a good question, and it's tough to answer because every teacher, you know, they teach differently. They approach their teaching with, you know, how they've learned and how they've been instructed. So. Um, I, I'd say you just have to personalize it. You have to know your students and you have to be adaptable because, well, as musicians, we're supposed to be adaptable anyway. Even in person, you're supposed to be able to work with um, a variety of different personalities. That's your job. You have to put the music first. And that's, I think, just put the music and learning first. And don't try to, I don't think, in my opinion, I don't try to be too serious. I mean, yes, you have to, students have to put in the effort. But you also have to remember that we're all human. So I try to bring a human element into it. So I don't know. I think I think that's important now, especially because everybody's, I think, online teaching for teachers as well as students can get really draining. So I think even when I start my lessons, I always ask the students how they're doing, if they went outside this week, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know. I, I just try to not... For some people, students appreciate just not talking about life and just getting down to brass tacks and, you know, playing their scales and playing their music. And But other students, they kind of need need an outside sort of like, let's talk about the world and then let's play some music. So I don't know if that answers your question, but Ooh, it does. I don't know. Long story short, it depends on the student and depends on the teacher. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. It's I do think that right now in this online realm, um, students seem to need like a little bit more support in general from all of us and so many of my students like I think hopefully are appreciative when you're like how's everything going and band and stuff they're like let me tell you like they just love they love that someone asked them how they were feeling so yeah I think that's great totally Cool. Okay, let's see. Um, another question we have is what is important to teach about the bassoon? Like you can get into like technical stuff <laughs> um, either online or in person. If it's different, you can talk about both or whatever. But what's yeah. important to teach about bassoon? Well, um, <laughs> everything. Uh, no, I'm start. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just like, huh, okay. Well, I know, so online versus in person, what's important to teach about the bassoon is since I can't be there and sometimes I can't see the whole instrument because it's a very long instrument. So for me, it's really important to teach the students what the names of all the keys are um, because I want to say, I need you to check this finger on this key. Is it there? And I need them to understand that when I say the E flat resonance key, that they know where that is on the instrument. And <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. So sometimes that's overlooked or okay so the low b flat key like they need to know where those things are or if i say i'm referring to like their top hand bottom hand left hand right hand um if sometimes i have students who've taken piano first and mm -hmm. so in piano it's one two three four five in bassoon when i'm talking about what finger you need to use sorry um mm -hmm. for bassoon you use all 10 of your fingers, just like piano, mm -hmm. your thumbs are your thumbs. So one starts with the index finger. So I do thumb, one, two, three, four. And so I, would, I need to make sure that that is clearly communicated to a student as well. Um, I'd say that's, that's one of the big things with online learning, uh, making sure that the language the students and I are speaking is the same one when we talk about bassoon technique and terminology and hand placement, all, all that stuff. Um, and then just in general with the bassoon, <laughs> um, 
everything. I, I believe in teaching a strong foundation and getting that really uh, strongly ingrained in a student because I didn't, I don't want to say I didn't have that. I was encouraged to have a strong foundation, but because I started the bassoon late, I was playing catch up pretty quickly. So I feel like I had to skip over a lot of things just for the necessity of time. You know, I had, I had to quickly learn stuff that, um, I, w I wouldn't say I wasn't prepared for it, but I just, I had to learn it faster. I didn't have the luxury of starting in middle school to, to get a strong um, foundation in the instrument, uh, the scales and all that, the technique. But um, so yeah, and that actually translates and helps with everyone's auditions as well with district all state. Um, students who trust me when I say, please practice your scales more and pre please practice in this method end up doing better. Um, yeah. But sometimes they don't trust me right away. So totally. once, once they do it, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. Uh, okay, so speaking about the foundation, like what is the foundation on bassoon that you're looking for that you would like consider is like, they're good to go on foundation? Uh, knowing all your scales. Not only knowing all your scales, um, but being able to play them evenly and in time and in tune. Once you do that, those are your building blocks. So once you can do that, that's you. You have an easy time doing other things. Um, but yeah, so if you can, and I, I like to use scales. I know students sometimes really hate scales, but I like to use scales to approach all the other concepts. So I'll use scales, and we'll focus on intonation. I'll use like through long tones, like playing the scales really slow so they can listen to the tuning. I'll use scales to focus on rhythms. There's, you can change the rhythms that you play and use when you're playing scales. And not only are you strengthening your knowledge of the scale itself, but when you uh, play other etudes or solo pieces that have these rhythms that you're doing in the scales, you won't be confused. Um, and I'm trying to think, and also air. I mean, when you want to develop a good sound, good tone, I always go back to scales. Um, scales, scales are great. <laughs> They're kind of like a, um, oh, what's the word? I, I love doing, I used to hate scales so much, but now for me, it's kind of like, you know, in yoga, when you just do like, you're, I don't know if you do, do you ever do yoga? Yeah. Okay. So, or any, anything that calms you, whether it's reading or whatever, or like, holding a warm cup of coffee or tea. Um, but anything that just kind of centers your brain, relaxes you, um, that's what scales are for me now. It's if I'm having trouble or I'm frustrated with what I'm working on, I just go back to scales and it's it's great. You can do so many things with them. So totally. It's yeah. like for me it's like calibration. Like I have to do my scales, my technical exercises to like calibrate for the day and then I can go. But if I don't, I'm like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to do anything. And it's like, yeah, totally. And I didn't pay her to say, do your scales, kids. Um, so <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> cool. cool. Not when, I mean, the bassoon is a wind instrument. It, it's weird as it might look and all the distracting key work it has. Um, it's, it's not, don't get discouraged. I don't tell people, don't get discouraged or um, uh, intimidated by the way the bassoon looks. It's just a wind instrument. If you know how to use your air, um, you can play it just as well as any other instrument. Awesome. Cool. Well, do you have any um, like parting thoughts for students or teachers who are listening about the bassoon or about like mindset or anything right now in this difficult time that you'd like to send everyone off with? Mm, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> Leave everybody. Practicing scales. <laughs> scales. No. Um, uh, well, I do want to say one thing about the bassoon that I've encountered. Well, the bassoon, because it is weird, I didn't even know that it in, it existed before I decided to play it. So, I mean, a lot of people in the school system are the same way. They don't really know much about it. Um, bassoonists, you know, there's actually more of us than people think. But if you don't, if you, if you don't, you're not in the world, it's hard to find us sometimes. So finding answers can sometimes be hard. But I know... When it comes to reads, I just want to say reads real quick, one really, really quick, um, especially over virtual lessons, you know, usually there's a tradition teachers will make their students reads. 
Um, obviously, that's an issue. You can't adjust reads for a student over this format. So it's really important wherever you are to, if you have an instructor, ask your instructor or um, ask somebody who would know where a good source of bassoon reads are because there are a lot of people and places that sell reads. They're not all great. So even the cheapest one doesn't mean it's going to play well. Um, I have students buy reads off Amazon that are great and some that are just, I don't know what they are. Um, they're not reads. But, <laughs> so number one, find really good source of reads because especially now it's worth the money buying good reads that work well because teachers are going to have a really hard time helping you adjust them if there is a problem. Um, and other than that, if there are any questions, oh, always look in the back of your etude book. If you don't know a fingering, don't forget. <laughs> a fingering chart, yeah. <laughs> this, is actually, this is actually true. So for the bassoon, there are so many what we call fake fingerings or alternate fingerings. So you can actually play the note and get it to come out, but it won't be the right fingering. And I have a lot of younger students who do this. They think they're playing the right note, but they're, they're not, the fingerings are not accurate. And so you have to go and they practice all week and then you realize they're not using the correct fingerings. So then you have to go back and they have to relearn the muscle memory of the fingering. So use a fingering chart and double check if, you do, if you're not sure. That's, that's it. And then have fun because the bassoon's a really fun instrument. Awesome, yeah, totally. Cool. Uh, I have like one more question that I thought of. Um, how, do, how does like a teacher go about knowing who to put on bassoon? Because I know at least in my school, like there were no fully beginning bassoon bassoonists like it was usually people switched over from another instrument is there like a sort of person that or like set up with i don't know some who plays bassoon best <laughs> honestly and i don't know also just you know i'm hearing a bit of interference i don't know if it's on your end but if it's not then we don't have to worry about it like, like okay there's thunder outside right now is it thunder maybe it's the storm uh sorry it's okay as long as you can still hear me then we're fine i can hear you okay great um so anybody who wants to play the bassoon should play the bassoon <laughs> that's my answer i always got really upset when i was younger and you know people would say oh you would be great on this instrument because i'd feel like i was left out and they didn't think i would be good on it so if you want to play the instrument just give it a try and play it um, obviously, it uses all ten fingers, so you need all ten fingers. People who have ten fingers should play the bassoon. Um, but there's, I, I don't, I haven't heard of a bassoon that has been altered. I'm sure it exists. There's been key work that can be altered. But um, if you like playing video games, you should play the bassoon because there's a lot of thumb dexterity. <laughs> if you like texting. You should play the bassoon because there's a lot of thumb dexterity. If you like giving people thumbs up, you should play the bassoon because <laughs> it's totally. Yeah, the bassoon's great because I know a lot of people also might think they like to play the flute because there are a lot of solos. They like to play the oboe because there's more solos in an orchestra or the violin, you know, stuff like that. Um, the bassoon does get solos. The bassoon is kind of a jack of all trades because it can play, and that's why I like playing it. It can play the bass line, the supporting bass line, like a tuba or you know the trombone or an upright bass. Um, it can do, it does that a lot, but it it also gets when it gets a solo, the, the solos are pretty cool too. So and it can play super low. So if you want an instrument that plays really low, you should play the bassoon. If you want an instrument that plays really high, you should play the bassoon because <laughs> it can do that as well. It has a really wide range. Um, yeah which means it can do a lot of things. It can play silly carnival music or really serious romantic melodies. So if you want to do everything, play the bassoon. Totally, yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's great sending off, like a sending off message for everyone. Everyone yeah. should play the bassoon because it does everything. <laughs> totally, cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Um, this was awesome and I really appreciate your time. And yeah, thank you so much, and I will see you later. Yeah, see you later. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye.
All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Rachel Jessack, uh, my good friend on the bassoon, and she is so friendly and knowledgeable about everything bassoon. Um, if you want to read more about her, uh, go to our website, bandrectorssurvivalguide.com, and you can also uh, check out our content there on the website or in our page, our group on Facebook, um, or on Instagram or YouTube, all by the same name, uh, Band Director's Survival Guide. And uh, if this interview helped you, I know bassoon is sometimes like a, a scary instrument to start teaching if you didn't actually study it. Um, if this instrument helped you, send it to someone else you think uh, could benefit from this knowledge because we're trying to make um, the knowledge from people like Rachel accessible to everyone out there. Um, so give us a like or a share and thank you again for watching. You can also uh, read on our website about uh, possibly working with Rachel this fall in one of our advancement programs. She's our bassoon teacher. And um, yeah, we hope you enjoyed everything, all this interviewing that we've been doing. Uh, this is our last one for right now. Um, but yes, we appreciate all the support and thank you so much.